Good evening, everybody, um, and thanks for joining um, our public health webinar on the Oak Processionary Mop. I might just um, wait a couple of moments. I can see people are still joining. And um, while people are joining, I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name is Deirdre Fay, and I'm a senior inspector in the Horticulture and Plant Health Division in the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Um, and it's really great to see um, so many people dialing in. You're all very welcome. And I hope you find the webinar informative um, and interesting this evening. And thanks for your time. Um, before we start, I'd, I'd just like to mention that we are recording the webinar and uh, with the intention to upload the recording onto the department's uh, YouTube channel. I'm joined this evening by a number of my colleagues. So I'll introduce uh, Joe McNamara, who is a plant health inspector. Joe works with me in the Horticulture and Plant Health Division. Um, I'd also like to introduce Robin Earle. Robin is an entomologist and Robin works in the Plant Science Division in the Department of Agriculture. And I'm also joined by Tom McDonald. Um, Tom is a forestry inspector um, and works in the forestry inspectorate in the department. So I think we'll kick off with the presentation now. And Robin, you're sharing the, um, the screen. So if I could ask you to move on to slide two, that'd be great. Thanks very much. So just to map out the running order for this evening, um, there will be three presenters. So I'll kick off uh, with a few introductory slides to give an overview of the plant health related work in the department. And then I'll hand over to Robin who will describe the oak processionary moth and what to look out for in terms of signs and symptoms. Robin will then hand over to Joe, who will um, describe oak processionary moth from an Irish context and provide some detail on the recent finding and the action that has been taken to date by the department, as well as information on additional resources. And just to note, there is an opportunity to use um, the questions bar. You'll see a questions tab. Um, on the webinar um, and if you feel free to um, ask any questions throughout the webinar but there will be some time at the end uh, in which we'll respond to the questions posed. The webinar is scheduled to run from seven until eight o'clock and the intention is um, to stick to that time so we can we can all um, enjoy some of the long evenings um, afterwards. I'll just ask you Robin to move on to the, um, the next slide please, thank you. Um, and, and the following slide as well. Thanks, Robin. So in terms of um, plant health in Ireland, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine is the national plant protection organization for Ireland under the International Plant Protection Convention. And in terms of plant health regulation, EU plant health regulation, the department has regulatory responsibility for the implementation of EU plant health regulation and the official controls regulation. Um, next slide, please, Robin. Thank you. So really, in the department, there's very much a cross-divisional collaborative approach taken to the plant health work of the department. Um, for example, we carry out a national plant health surveillance program, and this spans across both horticulture and plant health division, my own division, the Forest Service, um, and also crop evaluation and certification division. We also then support trade. In, in plants and plant products via issuing phytosanitary certificates and also inspecting consignments, um, which is done largely by the Import Control Operations Division. Um, the Plant Science Division runs a diagnostic um, service um, and also the Plant Risk Analysis Unit of the department uh, is, is, is within the Plant Science Division. And we also then um, collaborate with our colleagues in the Pesticide Control Division and the Pesticide Registration Division. Um, in relation to the plant health uh, work. If you want to move on to the next slide, please, Robin, thank you. So in 2019, we launched our plant health and biosecurity strategy with the objective of minimizing the threat posed to plants by the potential introduction and establishment of plant pests and diseases. Um, implementation of the strategy has focused on working closely with key um, partners, including other government departments and agency, agencies, industry, local authorities, non-governmental organizations, the scientific community, educators, and indeed all citizens, um, with the aim of ensuring that all stakeholders are aware of the risk to plant health in Ireland and their roles and responsibilities uh, to reduce that risk. 
Um, a midterm report was published last December and highlighted some of the key achievements to date, including investment in and upgrade of facilities at the border control posts, establishment of a pest risk analysis unit in the plant science division of the department, and also an expansion of plant health surveillance capability and network. Next slide, please, Robin, thank you. So the strategy is really under, underpinned by three key strategic principles around anticipating risk, implementing surveillance and management, as well as building awareness and communication. And I hope the webinar this evening will provide an overview of how these principles are put into action in the, contents, in the context of the current Oak Processionary Moth finding, um, in terms of knowing what's out there, having an appropriate and coordinated response and sharing information, which is what this webinar is, is all about. So I'm going to hand over to Robin now to present um, her slides. Thanks very much, Robin. Thanks, Deirdre. So I'm just going to cover what oak processionary moths are, what they look like, and um, the implications of them uh, trying to be an invasive species in Ireland. The oak processionary moth, they're actually quite a small uh, caterpillar. They get maximum up to three and a half centimetres. Um, but the main thing is that they're not ever on their own. They're always in a group. They're native to continental Europe um, and they're invasive in, uh, in Britain and they're invasive here. Um, the larvae, they're mostly associated with feeding on oak trees. Um, that's their preferred host. Uh, when limited oak trees are available, they can feed on other tree species such as beech, but it's not really certain if they can complete their whole life cycle on these, uh, on these other trees. It's mainly oak. If there's no food available or if they've run out of food on one tree, the caterpillars will migrate in a procession along the ground to a new tree, um, and which isn't seen so much here, but is seen in uh, continental Europe when there are a lot of con colonies and trees have been defoliated. So the early stages of their life cycle, they overwinter as eggs and the larvae, the eggs hatch and the larvae emerge in around April. They'll go through six lifestyles um, or life stages um, and they grow, as I said, up to uh, 3.5 centimetres. Um, from the third uh, life stage, um, they start developing the urticating hairs, which are the problem um, that they cause to uh, public health and animal health. They feed gregariously, so they feed in a group to, on all the leaves and can cause severe defoliation which weakens the trees and leaves them open to secondary infections. And as they develop when they're at the fourth uh, life stage, they will begin to migrate down the tree and form a communal silk nest. Um, and then each evening, um, as they feed nocturnally, they will, migrate, they will proce proceed up the tree in a procession um, to feed at night and, and proceed down the tree uh, before the morning to, uh, to wait during the day. So this is the, the mid stage around the, the stage where they're building the nests, um, life stage four. And this is the easiest time uh, to notice and see these larvae. Um, before then, they will be feeding at the very tops of the trees and they're not as noticeable. Then in their later life cycle or life stage, um, from about late June to early August, the larvae retreat entirely into the nests and will pupate uh, until they're ready to emerge as adult moths. Emergence can be from mid-July to mid-September, but the adult moths only live for about four days. Once they uh, have emerged, the females usually only fly as far as the top of the nearest tree. Um, to lay eggs, but they can fly up to 20 kilometers. Um, and they're attracted to light traps, so they can be found in moth light traps as well. Males, however, can fly much further, um, 20 kilometers to even 100 kilometers. And they're attracted to both light traps and pheromone traps. So the pheromone traps are used to monitor the populations um, and catch the male uh, moths to see what's out there. 
the main risk from these uh, these caterpillars are the hairs. Um, and while it's not the really long hairs that are seen here, um, it's actually microscopic, incredibly tiny hairs um, that can't be seen with the human eye. Um, I have put in a couple of arrows here. The blue arrows, if you can very faintly see, there's some very fine small hairs there. They're less than half a millimeter long. And then the red arrow is uh, part of the defense mechanism of the of the caterpillar. So if they feel threatened, um, they will flex this part of their body and it is the whole orange part there is um, densely packed fibers and it's all these um, hairs with this irritant in them. So once they flex that, a cloud of hairs will just puff up and out. And if there are hundreds of caterpillars in one colony and they all feel threatened, there will be a cloud of hairs puff up and out um, towards anyone or anything that they may feel threatened by. They can also do this um, if they feel a strong gust of wind. Um, the long hairs can be irritant too, but the microscopic hairs are the main problem. Um, and they're hollow tubes containing a protein called thometatopine, which I've mispronounced. Um, and they have jagged tips. So once they will pierce the skin and then release the contents into the skin. They do break very easily and they're, when fully grown, the cat, each caterpillar will have about 600,000 hairs. Um, the, the hairs also persist in the local environment. So if the caterpillars have grown up and grown into adult moths and moved on, the nest remains and it is full of hairs. And um, if the hairs blow onto um, the local surfaces, um, uh, if there's a bench under a tree or something like that, um, the hairs can stay there and uh, you can come into contact with them while the caterpillars aren't even uh, around. Um, so then we have the risk of invasion. Um, local Persephone moth has established in climatically similar areas to Ireland, such as England. Um, the outbreaks are also increasing in frequency and spreading further in Europe in response to warmer temperatures. Um, and we do have uh, lots of oak trees in Ireland and uh, we'd like to keep them safe. Um, that's about everything. And I'm going to hand over to Joe next. Hi everyone. Yeah, so my name is uh, Joe McNamara. I'm a plant health inspector with uh, the Horticulture and Plant Health Division of the Department of Agriculture. And if we just move on to the next slide, uh, basically I'm going to give you a background of OPM in the context of legislation and uh, the, the, the response of the Department of Agriculture to the current outbreak. So the oak recessionary moth, it's a protected zone pest. So you may ask, what is a protected zone? Yeah, so a protected zone uh, is a uh, an area of uh, well protected zone pests. They're, they're pests that are widespread in Europe, um, but not in all areas of Europe, despite favourable conditions uh, for them to establish. So Ireland has a high plant health status. We have uh, 23 different protected zones. So a member state can apply to have a protected zone status by submitting survey data for three consecutive years to verify absence of a particular pest. And once this is done, then uh, the protected zone status can be granted and uh, we must carry out the surveys then annually. So basically, if we gain a protected zone status, uh, it uh, allows us to uh, kind of implement extra regulatory restrictions on the movement of certain plants and plant products uh, into the protected zone. So this is essentially a barrier to trade because uh, you're free movement of goods within the European community. So we need to justify this by scientific data which we do in the form of uh, surveys, basically proving the, the absence uh, of the pest. So if we move on then to, to the next slide, Robin. So uh, this is the, the legislation with regards to open accessory moth. 
So the, the protected zone status is laid down in Annex 3 of Regulation 2019-2072. So the same regulation sets out the restrictions for the import of large oak trees uh, with a girth of uh, 8 centimetres and 1.2 metres above the root collar. So there are very strict uh, conditions for the importation of these large oak trees. And basically, there is no uh, EU member state that is currently able to comply with these conditions. So basically, we have a de facto prohibition on the import of oak trees, large oak trees, uh, from other member states uh, into Ireland. So this is not a full prohibition. Uh, it, it is still possible to import smaller oak trees, but uh, there are still still conditions that the uh, must be met with import importation of these goods. So basically. Uh, they must meet all the protected zone requirements. They must have a plant passport attached. So a plant passport, it's not just a traceability document. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's a label that uh, basically says that the, this batch of plants complies with all the, the legal requirements for the movement of these goods uh, into a protected zone. Uh, an exam will have to have taken place uh, of this batch of plants uh, by a competent person and there must be no uh, protected zone pests uh, present on the batch of plants. The plant passport must be attached uh, to the consignment uh, all the way to the end user and there must be a traceability code on it which will aid uh, the, the traceability end of things if there is an outbreak tracing it back uh, the source of the infection. So there must also be a notification of import of all oak trees as set out in statutory instrument 310 of 2021. That's our national legislation, it's enshrined. And uh, so basically this requires importers of oak trees and other high risk plants to uh, notify the Department of Agriculture uh, by email to plant on pests uh, at agriculture.gov.ie. And if we move on then uh, to the next slide run. So this is about our surveillance. So our, our plant health national surveillance plan. So we don't only carry out surveillance for protected zone pests. We also carry out surveillance for quarantine pests. Uh, these are pests that are not present in, in the EU, uh, but if they are present, uh, there is uh, emergency measures to control them. So uh, they're, they're, they're capable of establishment in the EU. And then priority pests will be a list of the 20 most uh, harmful quarantine pests uh, based on the potential environmental, social and economic damage that they can uh, carry out if they became established. So we carry out targeted surveillance in high risk areas such as points of entry uh, into the country, ports and airports. We also carry out surveillance uh, on professional operators. So professional operators are risk categorized based on their activities. So uh, professional operators are required annually to update uh, their professional activities. So this is information based on the kind of plants that they would import or, or sell and any other, other activities that could be deemed as high risk that will allow us to uh, collate a surveillance plan in, in a more targeted uh, manner. We also carry out then uh, general surveillance in public parks and roadsides. And uh, if we move on uh, further, Robin. So we'll talk about uh, OPM surveillance. So basically uh, this uh, entails visual surveys uh, between May and mid-July. So you can see a uh, plant health inspector there in the picture um, uh, sur 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 surveying uh, a mature oak tree. And the picture to the right is basically some of the kind of damage uh, of defoliation and skeletonization of leaves, uh, which is a trademark uh, of the oak possessory moth. So th these are the kind of signs and symptoms that we'll be looking out for uh, in our surveys. And uh, Robin also shared pictures of nests that are very distinctive and they become very large at this time of year. So uh, if we can detect an outbreak at this time of year, uh, it gives us uh, our, our largest potential of containing an outbreak. And then from mid-July onwards, we will pivot towards pheromone trapping. I said that these are routine surveillance uh, it, uh, kind of um, benchmarks that we carry out every year as required by the protected zone. So the, the, the picture in the bottom there is a green lantern style trap. Uh, so we would place um, a pheromone lure inside this trap. So the, there's um, a sex pheromone from the female uh, moth. It's, it's possible to artificially synthesize it and manufacture it and then fuse it into a, a lure uh, that we place inside the lid of this trap. Uh, it's a funnel trap. We place it about 10 meters in height up in the tree canopy, and this will then trap moths in a saline solution. And so basically we uh, check these traps every two weeks. 
and um, we do sometimes trap uh, non-target kind of organisms. You, you could have moths in them that are not open possessionary moths, but we do send all the contents of the lanterns to uh, our entomology team and the National Emergency Laboratory to be formally identified and uh, indicate uh, whether or not there's presence of the pest in the area. And then we'll, we will continue with uh, visual surveys during the winter months when the trees uh, are defoliated, basically. It, it will be easier to spot uh, the remains of a nest um, uh, at this time. And if we move on then to um, uh, our 2020 interception, so a lot of you listening might be aware that it's not our first interaction with this pest. So in 2020, there was a finding of oak possessory moth in a public park in Dublin by a member of the public. So a further investigation revealed that this tree was imported from another EU member state and planted shortly after. So the nest was removed uh, very quickly within six hours and formally uh, identified in our state lab. And so basically all the oak trees were then uh, kind of destroyed uh, that, that were associated with that batch. And uh, an intensive survey was carried out that didn't yield any findings. And subsequent to that, then, there were new uh, requirements uh, put in place for the notification of high-risk plants, uh, as I outlined earlier. So this was a, kind of a further restriction in order to try and mitigate uh, any uh, problems uh, or entry of these pests uh, into the country. So then uh, we move on to uh, the current outbreak and the Department of Agriculture's immediate response. So the next slide um, is uh, the reported sighting. So on June the 12th, uh, the department announced the finding of oak possessory moth. So this was uh, on foot of a suspected sighting by a resident in Dublin 15 housing estate. Uh, there were four young oak adjacent oak trees. So the sighting was reported uh, to our uh, the DAFM email address, plantandpests at agriculture.gov.ie. So based on the information that this citizen provided, there were pictures, geolocation, and a video. Uh, it was uh, immediately clear that uh, action was required. So um, if we move on then to uh, the next slide. So the department response then, uh, the nests, uh, nests were removed uh, within two hours of the notification being received. Then there was subsequent removal and destruction of the affected trees on the same day to try and mitigate any spread uh, of the pest. So uh, the department's uh, generic contingency plan for plant health, uh, it's a framework document outlining the procedures to be followed uh, during an outbreak. So this plan was activated. So it outlines uh, all the requirements and benchmarks uh, that need to be followed uh, during uh, the outbreak of a serious plant pest disease. Um, so on foot of this, an emergency coordination group uh, was established to take responsibility for the implementation of this plan. And um, if we, we follow on then to our, our role of diagnostics in our immediate response. So uh, the samples were submitted to our National Reference Laboratory uh, Entomology Team and basically they confirmed uh, in a laboratory report the first recorded presence of an outbreak of the oak possessory moth in, on the island of Ireland. And they also then uh, provided a review of uh, suspected reports from members of the public and guidance for eradication and treatment options uh, at the time uh, that the outbreak was discovered. And we move on then to uh, the, the current action plan and surveillance um, and, and in the next slide. So basically one of the elements of the contingency plan for the outbreak uh, of uh, pests um, is uh, the, the drafting of a pest specific action plan. So this outlines a timetable for the measures to be implemented, uh, the methodologies for sampling and testing, the demarcation of the infested area, public engagement, which took the form of um, technical notes, fact sheets, uh, press releases, uh, social media engagement, and leaflet drops in the locality uh, of, of the, uh, the outbreak. And then probably the most uh, crucial element of the action plan is the design and organization uh, of an intensive survey uh, in the demarcated area. So basically uh, a radius of five kilometers from the source of the outbreak uh, what was um, kind of used to create the demar demarcated area. This is based on common flight distance of a female. So this yielded an area of 78 square kilometers that was required to be surveyed. So the demarcated area was divided into survey blocks uh, of 500 meters by 500 meters, each block having a unique identifier number. And then these uh, unique blocks were then delegated to uh, our teams of surveyors uh, to, to carry out surveys on. So if we move on then to uh, our investigation. 
So uh, another requirement of our contingency plan is conducting an investigation to determine the source and the extent uh, of the outbreak. So basically this will involve identifying any pre uh, professional operators that could be associated with, with any trees that were a source of the outbreak. Uh, the, um, because of the traceability system uh, that's in place uh, with the requirements under the plant health uh, regulation, uh, we're able to trace back any affected batches and identify uh, professional operators. We're then able to trace forward uh, from these professional operators and identify any other locations that they would have interacted with and included them in our follow-up surveys and then um, uh, and inspections and then a collection of data by means of an intensive survey. So I suppose the positive news uh, so far is that uh, in our demarcated area we've uh, surveyed over four and a half thousand uh, host plants thus far and there has been no further uh, sightings of oak possession moth but uh, we're uh, at this point I suppose halfway through our survey will be pivoting towards uh, the uh, pheromone trapping uh, element of the survey from uh, the middle of this month until uh, mid-July until mid-September and basically uh, if there are any um, collection of oak possessionary moth in, in these samples it could be indicative then of local population in any area and uh, will point towards kind of further eradication and control measures uh, that are required. So uh, if we move on then uh, to guidance and support. So basically um, the latest information is available on our website uh, gov.ie forward slash plant health. You'll find uh, details on oak possessionary moth there, the do's and don'ts, what to do. If you see it, uh, there will be trader notices issued if there are any further actions required of professional operators. Uh, there are fact sheets, our pest risk analysis unit in our plant science division have developed very informative fact sheets, not just in oak possessionary moth, but in all our priority pests and many of our protected zone pests. And you can view these and become familiar with the, the, our national plant health requirements. And finally, if you do uh, see any uh, suspected sighting, which just urge you to treat it with extreme caution and notify the Department of Agriculture immediately and give us your contact details, geolocation and any other uh, useful information that you may have by emailing it to plantandpests at agriculture.co.ie. Thank you very much. So now we have, uh, I think, a Q&A session. That's great. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, and thanks very much, Robin. Um, I'm just going to go to the um, the questions now. I see a few questions coming in. Um, so we'll have a look at these. Um, and thanks very much. Um, there's a couple of questions um, uh, for you, Joe, um, in relation to... What I just... Um, I'm having difficulty... Yes, um, the conditions associated with the, um, the, the the importing oaks over eight centimeters. Can you just elaborate on that, um, Joe? Yeah, so all these conditions are outlined in uh, Annex 10 of Regulation 2019-2072. So uh, with the, the main condition is that they are grown in a country where uh, oak recessionary moth is not known to occur. There are, uh, there are other conditions uh, may occur. And uh, the supplier uh, or the country uh, must be able to guarantee a uh, pest-free area uh, uh, through surveys uh, or kind of um, must be able to prove that the, uh, the, the plants were grown in an environment that could not have been exposed uh, to oak recessionary moth. So all these, these are outlined in detail in Annex 10 of Regulation 2019-2072. And so currently no EU member state are able to comply with these requirements for uh, trees with a girth of over uh, 8 centimetres at 1.2 metres above the root colour. But as I said, uh, there is no prohibition on the, uh, the import of uh, oak trees less than this uh, because they're, they're not favoured by the, the female moth for laying eggs. They do have a preference for more mature trees. With that being said, as, uh, th these, must, these smaller trees must comply with our protected zone requirements. They must have undergone an examination by a competent person and uh, have a plant passport attached and must be free from uh, protected zone pests. Thanks, Joe. And just staying with you, Joe, um, just in relation to the number of years the survey for OPM has been carried out um, and at which locations and uh, traps 
the number of traps set annually. I suppose I can maybe start answering that question by saying that we have um, regionally based uh, plant health inspectors um, and surveys would be carried out um, at uh, the premises of professional health operators um, and also, as, as Joe uh, alluded to earlier in the presentation, you know, um, in the wider environment as well. Um, and, and the surveys have been carried out for for um, the last number of years. Joe, can you comment on that? On that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And basically, the surveys are required for all protected zone pests uh, for which we have a protected zone status for. So basically, when the protected zone status was issued uh, a number of years ago, uh, the, the survey work uh, would have uh, begun. Thanks, Joe. Um, and also a question there in relation to um, where we think the, the recent, recent finding, how it arose. Now, give that one yeah. to Joe. Yeah, so gen generally the, these um, findings are associated with the, the movement of goods. Uh, so as I said, we're conducting uh, an investigation at the moment, uh, which includes uh, trace back uh, with professional operators um, and also then uh, any surveys uh, with regards to visual surveys and uh, also then uh, our pheromone trapping. So if we do locate uh, any uh, further findings, uh, look, that will play into kind of um, identification of the pathway of infection. Um, thanks, thanks, Joe. Uh, there's another question there. Um, are there plans after the initial survey to extend the survey beyond the five kilometer radius? So um, we're, we're, that work is underway at the moment. Um, and uh, depending on the, 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 the outcome of that, and as Joe said to date, and um, there have been no further findings of OPM, which is very positive. Um, we will be from mid July setting um, traps um, and and lures uh, as as the moth um, moves on to the the the, the moth life part of the life cycle. Um, do you want to comment any further in relation to that, Joe? Um. So basically, uh, we would identify the risk factors in the survey. The most uh, intensive uh, elements of the survey are within the, the one kilometer radius and the infected uh, area of the 500 meters. Uh, the, these trees were given a very thorough examination. Then we extend outwards in one kilometer radius bands uh, and in the 500 meter grids. So uh, there is potential to maybe extend it out uh, in the direction of the prevailing wind because this is an added risk factor for uh, perhaps the spread of the pest. So these are things that we're looking at along with pivoting towards the, uh, the uh, pheromone trapping element uh, of the survey. Okay, Th thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, Tom, I might call on you there. There's a couple of uh, forestry um, related um, questions you might be able to 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 answer. Uh, there's some in relation to um, ash dieback, um, Dutch alum, and uh, importing timber. Do you comment on on those? Yes, uh, thanks, Deirdre. Uh, Share my webcam. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good. Yeah, look, look there, there, there are a couple of questions there in, in relation to uh, um, uh, difficulties and recent difficulties that we've had with uh, um, pe uh, pests and pathogens uh, getting into the country. Um, and what can we do to stop that? Um, I suppose the general position on uh, plant health is that we are seeing an increasing number and range of harmful organisms emerging um, and becoming issues and threats to um, the EU uh, and to Ireland and to other countries um, as a result of uh, climate change, perhaps, and, and uh, trade patterns. Um, and uh, look, this is going to be uh, an increasing um, phenomenon as as, uh, as the years go on, uh, and the impact of climate change in particular is going to have uh, perhaps a, an exacerbating effect on the trees that we have here uh, and how they can cope with uh, with attack, and also the behaviour um, of 
uh, endemic pests uh, and, and pathogens and ones that can be introduced. Um, in terms of what we can do about it, um, as Deirdre mentioned at the start, we do have um, an import controls division um, and their responsibility is to um, implement the uh, requirements of the Plant Health Directive, uh, which lists uh, plants and plant products and uh, um, uh, other commodities which are subject to phytosanitary control for the uh, reason of potential introduction of harmful organisms. Um, and this is um, this is a, an EU uh, legislative uh, mechanism, but within which, um, as Joe mentioned, uh, we have additional provision because we are a, an island uh, and we don't have the, the range of harmful organisms that are in place uh, in other countries. And we have the provision to put additional um, safeguards in, in terms of what we can say about um, where uh, plants and plant products may originate and what sort of conditions they would need to meet. And all of that, <coughs> excuse me, all of that needs to be justified in terms of the science behind it uh, and putting it through a, a legislative process because what goes hand in hand with the, <coughs> with the EU plant health directive is, is the fact that we are part of a single market and there are no checks on the borders. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, relying on partnership with uh, other EU countries in relation to uh, the good status of material coming our way. Um, and in addition to all of that, um, as we're trying to emphasize in the uh, plant health and biosecurity strategy, um, everybody has a role to play uh, in terms of plant health. Um, all of the stakeholders, um, ourselves as regulators, yourselves as, as traders and operators, professional operators, uh, I suppose the, uh, the, the, key, um, the key message would be to source material from reliable reliable places and reliable and re reputable sources, uh, which will all help in the, in the greater mix of uh, delivering uh, and maintaining good plant health status. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, and there was a question in relation to the tree check app. If you could comment on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we uh, we have a, a web-based application called TreeCheck. Um, it is running. Um, it's also in the hands of our IT people who are uh, um, refining it at the moment. Uh, but it is a useful way to report in um, issues you may identify, uh, which will come directly to us, uh, um, but we can follow through. It, it allows for uh, the upload of photographs and the provision of of location information and content information to us directly uh, online. So um, it, it is available and it is working um, uh, with some caveat that the IT side is, is uh, providing some additional functionality to it at the moment. Um, but yes, it is there as a, as a mechanism for reporting. That's great. Thanks, Tom. Um, there was a question there in terms of uh, ranges we have with Northern Ireland counterparts. So we, we work very closely with uh, our, our Northern Ireland plant health counterparts, mm -hmm. um, given that, uh, you know, we are an island and it's considered to be a sin single epidemiological unit. Um, and we recently um, um, put out uh, contingency plans for priority pests out to public consultation in the spring. Um, and um, in, in advance of those, we had in advance of that we had shared the contingency plans um, with with our public uh, with our Northern Ireland counterparts. So there is quite um, there's quite good um, uh, engagement um, ongoing and continuous with with the Northern Ireland counterparts in in, in, the, in the area of plant health. Um, Robin, there's a couple of questions there. Just maybe you, I could uh, I could ask you to um, to answer uh, if, if that's okay. Um, there, there was a question in relation to um, the. Uh, sorry, there was a question in relation to um, whether they feel on whether they feed on Hollam oak, um, and also there was a question in relation to um, how much damage d does the moth do to the oak trees in the long term, um, and I think there was a couple of other questions as well. But maybe start with those, please, Robin. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that's no problem. 
Um, whole milk, yes, they will feed on it. Um, they do tend to have a preference in, um, for uh, oak trees, so they're going to go for the more deciduous ones before anything evergreen. Um, but yeah, they'll feed on all oaks. Um, then the damage to the tree, it's more about weakening the tree um, and maybe allowing uh, a secondary infection that would be more dangerous to a weakened tree in. As far as I'm aware, unless there's a very severe inf infestation, the trees, it, it's more of a public health issue rather than um, the tree being um, extremely threatened. Um, there was also a couple of questions on um, natural predators. Um, so yes, there are uh, natural predators of oak processioning moth. Uh, most of them are in the native range of the moth. Um, so they will be in continental Europe. There'll be a lot of um, uh, parasites and uh, parasitoids, uh, different fly species um, will attack them. and with any invasive species, the predator takes uh, a little while longer to follow them. So as the OPM has spread through the Netherlands, they started to see the different predatory fly species um, a few years later start to follow them. Um, but we don't have those species. And what we do have that do uh, predate on OPM are um, cuckoos, um, the, I think it's the blue tits or great tits and bats. Uh, but particularly cuckoos um, do very well. Um, they're the one bird that really uh, seems to really like them. I really like, love to eat them. Thanks, Thanks very much, um, Robin. Uh, there was also a question in, in relation to the, the, the current outbreak. Is it considered to be a single colony or four colonies? I'm not sure whether, Robin, you want to take that or, or Joe. Uh, so basically, there were, were four nests uh, found on four adjacent oak trees. Um, they, they, there was a, a nest from uh, a previous season, so there was evidence uh, that they had multiplied, uh, and yeah, they, they, but there was no evidence that they had spread beyond these four oak trees. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joe. Um, then there is a question in relation to how are the affected trees destroyed, Joe? If you could, if you could answer that, that'd be. Yeah, so the, the affected trees were destroyed by uh, incineration. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also um, just a question in relation to, um, you know, suspected sightings. Can they be reported on this tree check app? We're asking um, any suspected sightings should be uh, treated with extreme caution and um, notified immediately to DAFM at the um, email address plant and pests at agriculture.gov.ie. Um, and I'm just looking down through the questions here. To see which ones are yet to be answered. Um, there's a question in relation to the possibility of stopping importing plant material altogether. So um, just in relation to that, you know, we're very much working under uh, the EU uh, plant health regulations. Um, I don't know, do you want to say something on that, Joe, uh, from your time in the um, import controls division? Yeah, so basically all plants for planting are subject to, from third countries, non-EU countries are subject to 100% checks uh, at the point of entry. Uh, basically these also must comply with the Annex 10 requirements. And also then, like if we are, uh, if there is a prohibition on moving to certain plants, it has to be based on scientific data. So, uh, and based on risk assessments, 
So the current data suggests that uh, these uh, uh, small immature oaks are not as a high risk and uh, it's not uh, proven that this is an infection pathway and also they must be inspected uh, prior to import. So um, and conscious that we are a member of the European community as well, the free movement of goods. So if we are uh, implementing a prohibition of goods, it has to be based on scientific data. Um, th thanks, thanks for that, um, Joe. Um, and then there's a question in relation to uh, resources um, in, in carrying out um, inspections at garden centres. Um, so I suppose we have, as I, as I mentioned at the start, there's you know several divisions working in the department um, across the plant health area. The horticultural and plant health division has dedicated resources for um, annual um, plant health surveillance um, at both garden centres and nurseries. Um, since uh, 2020, um, there have been um, increased uh, infrastructure um, at the at border control posts for in terms of checking consignments. Um, so the resources, there's there's a quite a comprehensive uh, suite of resources in place uh, for for checking um, for checking um, plants and, and, and plant and plant products. Um, uh, as part of our um, regulatory responsibilities under the plant health regulation. Um, there was a couple of other questions. Um, there was one, let me see, um, in relation to whether it was just about the, the occurrence of OPM. So we had, as, as Joe mentioned in his previous, in, in his presentation, we had a finding, one finding in 2020, uh, which was considered to be an interception. It was found on a recently planted Im imported uh, tree at that time. Um, this finding um, is, is considered to be um, an outbreak. Um, as, as Joe mentioned, we uh, four colonies uh, were found, or four nests were found um, at a site in Dublin. Um, and they are the only findings of, of oak processionary moth uh, that we have had uh, to date and, and we're responding as Joe outlined to the, 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 the current outbreak. Um, and I'm just looking down through the questions here to see, I think we may have, unless anyone else, um, any of the other panellists can uh, indicate that I haven't um, covered some of the questions. Yeah, Deirdre, there's one question there in relation to pest risk analysis. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Um, have Daphne done a disease pest risk analysis? Um, regarding yeah, so, the um, Go ahead, uh, Tom. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, we do have a best risk analysis unit uh, in the department. Uh, so there's dedicated resources there and their job is to horizon scan um, for uh, for potential uh, threats related to uh, imports and other areas. Um, I know they have done some work in relation to species which may be used in the, in the scheme that's mentioned there, the acre scheme. I don't know, uh, have they looked at white thorn, which is raised uh, specifically, but we can check uh, check that out with them. But they are actively uh, involved on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in the area of pest risk analysis. Um, so look, I'll, I'll take that away and, 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 uh, and ask them. I don't, I don't know. I don't, actually, I don't know, is there anybody from the, from the unit on the line? I don't, I don't think there is. But I, listen, I'll take that away and, uh, and ask them about it. And if we just add in relation to Whitethorn that it is a protected zone host for uh, fire blight. And so any importation of white thorn, uh, it must come from a pest free area within the EU. And it also must have undergone an examination by a competent person and have a plant passport attached to the end user, which will allow for traceability requirements as well. Uh, thanks, Joe. And uh, there's a couple of questions there in relation to um, non compliance and following up on non compliance. Can you comment on that? Uh, Joe. Yeah, so basically we have uh, our, our statutory instrument in place that uh, gives us uh, statutory powers uh, to 
to lay down uh, the requirements of the plant health regulation. So there are uh, sanctions in place. Uh, so professional operators are registered uh, with us and we can revoke uh, registration. And there's also uh, a, a possible implementation of fines uh, available to us as well, uh, the legal framework for prosecution. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just scanning through the questions here, and I think we may have covered the majority of them now. Um, so what we'll do is after the webinar, we'll have um, we'll we'll receive a full list list of the questions, um, and any that we haven't responded to, um, we can we can follow up um, directly. With, with the person who, who has asked the question. Um, so I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's coming up to um, five to eight now. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, um, in particular the presenters, my fellow presenters, Joe and Robin, um, for, their, for their presentations this evening. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, jo, uh, Tom from the Forestry Inspectorate who joined as a panelist this evening to respond to some of the questions. Um, and thanks very much um, for, for dialing in. I hope you found the session informative. Um, and as I say, we'll respond to any questions that um, may have been overlooked um, uh, directly to the, to the person that asked the question. Thanks again and um, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat>